great session. Why don't we get started and, and allow people to join in? Uh, some very familiar names on the guest list um, that for both you and me, but also a lot of uh, new investors joining for the first time. Um, maybe I can just kick it off with a little bit of introduction about Grip and then, then hand it over to you to learn more. Um, to everyone who's joined us, thank you so much for taking time on a Saturday evening. As you know, GRIP is a platform that facilitates investors to participate in lease financing opportunities or opportunity to lease physical assets to companies like Fieldworks. Uh, each week, we bring a new investment opportunity for you through our platform, GRIP Invest, um, and allow you the opportunity to make your own decision on whether you'd like to invest or not. This week, we have a, a very interesting opportunity, which is a combination of two companies in very different sectors with very different assets. The first one, uh, and Sachin, Sachin uh, the founder of the company, Peelworks, is with us today. Uh, I, I, won't, I won't get into what Peelworks does, uh, but the asset that we're leasing to them are storage racks, which we believe is one of the most interesting assets and opportunities that we have going forward, especially as warehousing and logistics becomes a larger play, uh, play in the market. The, other deal that is combined in this opportunity is with Blue Tokai, which is a specialty coffee brand. And we are leasing them coffee machines for their cafes as well as, as for deployment in B2B partners like a Four Seasons Hotel or a WeWork, which provide uh, Blue Tokai coffee as part of their offerings. Um, Sachin, uh, you know, thank you again for, for being here. Uh, it's been interesting to, come, to talk to your team, to you, to learn more about your business. But for the, for the benefit of our investors, would love for you to share a little bit about yourself personally. You've had an interesting and long career with HUL, and then you made the shift to start something um, in a logistics space, um, as well as a software, or initially as a software space in the, in, the, in the field management business. Would love to hear your journey from HUL to this, as well as what is the business that Fieldwork does today. Thanks, Nikhil. Thanks, uh, Vivek, for, uh, uh, for having spent in investor so much time in in understanding our business and uh, reviewing the proposal uh, we had for you and also taking it to your investors i know you have enough opportunities chasing your business so uh, so thank you so much for making time also thank your investors uh, to have made it on this saturday uh, evening and uh, listen to us i i see some some familiar names myself i think Wiplov and uh, we go back black soil is a venture debt uh, provider uh, with us, so uh, so we have a strong relationship with Black Soil already, and uh, Shubham again. I think uh, we've interacted in some forum, uh, so so it's good to see some familiar names. Uh, our business actually is when I quit HUL, I quit with the understanding uh, of fifteen years that you know there is six percent for a distributor, twelve percent for a retailer, and two and a half to three percent at the minimum of logistics, which is a cost that a consumer goods company incurs to reach out to the shelves. OK, uh, so if you just total this up, we are talking about 23, 24 odd percent. And we are now talking scale of Unilever. So if you if you look at a youngish FMCG company, the expense could be much higher because they don't get synergies of scale. Uh, they have to pump in higher margins into the retail outlets. They also spend a lot more to acquire distributors for themselves. Now, if a quarter of sales of a com consumer goods company is actually getting lost in the value chain from its factory to the shelf, I think that's a lot of money that's going waste. And how do you how do you come to the subjective comment of a lot of money? Because if you go back and look at the balance sheet of listed consumer goods companies today, I think most of these companies operate at a fifteen percent to twenty percent EBITDA, right? Now, if you're going to, if you're spending twenty four twenty five percent on on actually non value adding parts of your supply chain, uh, my philosophy is there's a lot of lot of flap there to be cut. In fact, I would reckon that this this could actually come down to about 15% in the next five to 10 years, right? And the balance 10% is what companies like us would like to take some share off and also give some share back to the consumer goods companies so that there is a win-win. So that's really our, our model here, right? So there is a 10% uh, efficiency loss that happens in the value chain of a $300 billion industry 
simply because it's not optimized for supply chain, it's not optimized for inventory, it's not optimized for working capital, right? So people are over-inventorized, under-inventorized, there's a lot of back and forth that happens, there is freshness which becomes an issue on the food supply chain. So there are so many complexities and it's so under technology driven that 10% of sales is actually a sitting duck. It'll take a, it'll take a while, like I said, five to 10 years to realize that, but then the, 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 the pie is very large, right? So 10% of a $300 billion industry tells you you're talking 30 billion uh, as, as money to be taken away, right? But that's not a small industry. And it's an industry that grows, right? It grows at eight to 10% year on year. We've never had a year where consumer goods have declined, right? So either they premiumize, right? So you have a lot of cosmetics and uh, you know premiumization of the portfolio that happens when the economy is doing well, when the per capita is going up. When the per capita goes down, then a lot of consumption of low value items goes up, right? So either which way is this industry always grows. So it's a fantastic industry to get into, a fantastic market size, a very large problem, very well-established problem, and a problem that all players want solved. The distributors do not want to be distributors. Consumer goods companies don't want to deal with 3000 distributors. Retailers want credit and they want in-time inventory. They don't want to be ordering only once a week. They want to order at the time that they want something. They want to order in the quantity that they think they can sell in two, three days. So they want to under inventorize, reduce their working capital. And none of this is happening in the current market structure. This is what we are actually trying to solve here, right? Mm -hmm. So our competitors are distributors. So we want to replace them, right? Uh, I was talking to somebody who's looking at an equity investment in the company and uh, they said, do you compete with Reliance or Amazon or do you compete with distributors? So I said, you know, because you know, we compete with distributors. I think it's a trick question. So, <laughs> so you should be very clear. These guys have just gotten started, right? Yeah. In fact, Amazon distribution is one of our key customers. So they collaborate with us. They don't compete with us. So right. we are the only front end partners in Bangalore for Amazon distribution. Uh, front end partner means we manage the customers, we manage the supply chain, we manage the warehouse, and we are on a percentage GMV cut on, on, on a, in terms of a business model. In parallel, we run our own large business called Taiki, which, which was, uh, which does about 100 crores GMV on a monthly basis, but off late because of some working capital issues, and that's why we're talking to you here. Uh, we, we are actually, we've dropped on, on sales, and with this infusion, uh, we're looking to go back up. Our idea is to get to about 100 crores in the next, uh, you know, three months or so uh, on a monthly basis as GMV. Uh, we yesterday signed up another five crores of working capital, uh, which, is, which was not in your note because it, the note went out before this got done. And we did not want to write work in progress on your uh, note because that is misleading for investors, right? So there is a firm that uh, we... We've signed up with who's extending a five crore working capital line to us in Bangalore starting Tuesday. Then we've also got a confirmation from a few HNIs in Bombay who are syndicating to invest 50 lakhs in the company. That also happened last evening. So both these will come in in the course of next week. Plus, there is a term sheet from Ugro, which is on channel financing. I don't know whether that got a mention in your note or not, but that's also. No, yeah, so, so we have about eight to 10 crores of capital now in play on the working capital side. And interesting thing, Nikhil, is that this ultimately is a negative working capital business. It's just that you have to scale it uh, using capital, but once you've scaled it to uh, 1800 crores, you can start returning the working capital back. And you can actually use Nikhil's money to pay Vivek and Vivek's money to pay Sachin, and then the, the go round starts, right? And if you have a clever finance team, which we have, you're able to slowly start reducing working capital and become profitable, right? So our business model on the B2B side, which is our flagship business called Taiki, Taiki is nothing but goddess of prosperity. So our value prop to the customer is that uh, we, bring, we deliver prosperity to your doorstep, prosperity in the, in the form of grocery, right? So like any other e-commerce product, they look at the app, order on the app, that order goes to our fulfillment center, which is a warehouse. Our smallest warehouse is 3,000 square feet. We pay about 20 bucks to 30 bucks per square feet, depending on which place we are in. From there, the orders are picked and packed. What we sell is oil, staples, consumer goods, cosmetics, pens, stationery. What we don't sell is fruit and vegetable, 
uh, dairy products, uh, anything that requires cold chain like ice cream, we don't sell all that, right? So we are also very clear on what we will sell and what we will not sell. We don't like quick perishables because your write-offs can be higher, right? Uh, and the market is so large that we don't want to play the difficult bets just yet. In the peak, we were serving 30,000 orders in a, on a month. So we have the capability. Our tech is in-house. Uh, the order is then delivered. We accept payment via UPI, cash, RTGS, and EFT. Uh, so if, within four days, we're able to turn around our capital. Our objective is to make eight rotations of capital in a, in a month. And every rotation uh, has to deliver a contribution margin for us, which helps us recover cost of capital and our index. So at the current level, we're almost break, breaking even at the contribution margin level. And indirects get covered by, if you look at the Amazon business, there is something called AWS, which Amazon has, which is a very profitable golden goose that supported its B2C arm for a long time. We have something called 1SF, which is a technology product for Salesforce management. HUL is one of our largest customers. It's a 10-year-old customer. It's a SaaS business. It's tech and services combination. It helps them get most out of their salespeople. So that business collects about 80 lakhs a month as SaaS revenue with almost an 85% contribution margin, right? Uh, that business is not just 10 years old, but is also scaling up, right? So we are looking to add another six to seven lakhs of revenue just from that. So we want 1SF to cover our indirects and we want Taiki to be unleashed at contribution margin break-even level and become a 100 crore, 150 crore business by the end of June, okay? By the end of June, the company is looking to raise a 30 to $50 million private equity round with EBITDA positive as a company with an outlook to become a 2 to $3 billion GMV player at 2% net margin of sales as EBITDA uh, by the end of 24 calendar year. Uh, ambition, I, I spent my time 15 years with HUL, a listed company, uh, top of the line talent, top of the line ethics, and uh, and commitment to the country. Uh, my ambition is to take this company public uh, by the end of 23. So we are two to three years away uh, from there. So, uh, so I'm very hopeful that with the current round that we are closing on working capital and the next equity round, which is gonna be the last round of capital the company raises, uh, we should be able to take this company public. So that's, that's really our story. Got a bunch of passionate leaders in the company. Some of them are on the call right now. Uh, Corona, I hate to say it, it's a problem for every, for the entire human race. But professionally speaking, it is not a problem for us. It only accelerates our sales because distributors pack up. They're not able to cope up with the environment uncertainty, uh, like getting passes for essential services or, or also being able to retain their workforce and be able to offer them, like we, we our entire workforce switches to a PPE, they get a hygiene allowance for sanitization and so on. I mean, things which a responsible employer, employer will do, which a distributor is not able to, so they lose talent, they lose their markets. Uh, last round, because there was a proper shutdown, some retail stores never opened back up, so they lost a lot of capital, which they had given out as credit. We don't. Uh, we don't offer credit on our books at all, but we are working with NBFC so that they can offer credit, but this is not the time to be offering credit to retailers, right? It's an unpredictable, unreliable segment. Uh, so we will come to credit in good days. Uh, to summarize our value proposition, which is what we are looking to get from you, is to be able to scale fast, which means we no, need more warehouses, which means there is more capex. We want to lease that capex back to Grip Finance and become a strategic partner for Grip so that whenever we open a warehouse, there is Grip which is taking on the capex uh, on its books and, and we get the racks and shelving equipment. Uh, our key customer on this side is only Amazon. Otherwise, we deal directly with with uh, suppliers like Unilever, ITC, Procter & Gamble, Racket, and, and so on. Um, our value prop is to close, to serve a million Indian customers, which is corner stores or grocery stores or Kirana stores, uh, with a very wide assortment of consumer goods, priced comparatively, available promptly, and with a facility to pay later, which is the part on credit. So we are there, we're walking towards that journey. And that is the journey which we want to one day list in the Indian Stock Exchange. Okay. So that's awesome. about so, us. Yeah. Uh, no, Sachin, thank you for uh, constructing that vision. 
um, let me, there are three silos to your business, right? And I remember Vivek and me taking some time with, you know, Satano and your team to figure out each one because there's a slightly different element to it. And um, I'll try to spend a few minutes making sure that the people on the call are, uh, can e equally take that away. One is, as you mentioned, uh, your equivalent of a golden goose for AWS, which is your software, pure software business that you do for HUL. I understand this is an 11 year contract uh, that has been running with a 75 to 80 lakh rupee monthly revenue and incredibly profitable. You mentioned 85% gross margins, right? Uh, and um, obviously there are a few other clients in that segment, but HUL is, is, the, is the bulk of that business. And um, given your understanding of HUL, given your understanding of the space, obviously that's a contract that you see scaling and continuing in the future, right? The other two parts of your business are the logistics and the warehousing business. One which is done purely for Amazon as a B2B play where you support Amazon's distribution to wholesalers, right? Um, on that side and, and it's a take on the GMV that you do. Uh, but the, probably the most interesting part from your perspective is what you call Taiki, 50% uh, of your current revenue and which is basically enabling, and I, I love this statement, it's on your website, you're enabling groceries to still continue to be the largest retailers in the world, right? Indian groceries to be the largest retailers in the world. Um, I think that's a powerful proposition because in all the years of online e-commerce, domestic grocery Kirana stores that store around the corner has still not been you know, done away with. And it, it will probably never done away with. There is tremendous amount of inefficiency and loss in margins from a brand perspective, as well as a retailer perspective that you are trying to solve as a company. Right. Um, and you know, I, I, the point on working capital management is well taken. Thank you for talking about how grip plays a role in it. Uh, maybe just if you could um, dive into the Taiki business, right? Sure. Um, is it fair to say that that similar to how some of us would go online and order something, this is providing a retailer the ability to do that, obviously in larger quantities and get it the next day or, or the day after that, pay on delivery, order exactly what he wants um, and the convenience of ordering online. Is that, is that a fair way to, to contextualize it? Absolutely, that's right. That's that's what it is, Nikhil. So you got it okay. completely right. That's what, and I and I see a question here from Manoj, where he's yeah, asking, okay. uh, what's the difference between B two B e commerce vertical and Uran? So actually, the difference is that Uran is a multi category player. So they go into apparels and they get into footwear and they get into grocery. So they are in the electronics and durables and so on and so forth. Um, so that's one. We are sharply focused on grocery, and we have absolutely no intention to look at other categories at this moment. Uh, there is a lot of meat just in the grocery segment, right? Uh, the second big difference is Oran burns about half a billion dollars every year uh, for a revenue, which is a quarter of that. Uh, we, we are at about 40, 50 lakhs of monthly burn. Uh, and, and we actually focus on building a profitable business. So, so I think the, the, the approach uh, that the players are taking to the market are completely different. Multi-category, single category. Uh, let's burn and do land grab and see one day we might have a business uh, versus saying every distributor makes money from the 6% they get from the company. So if you're not profitable from say six month onwards, your business model has a problem, right? Because the more you scale, the more you burn, right? So, so they're very different business models, very different thinking. Uh, are we solving the same problem? The answer is yes. Right. But are we approaching the market in the same way? Completely different approaches. So, yeah, so right. let's see which, which approach is right. Yeah. In fact, one of the things that caught our attention was you've been able to scale to a, if I'm not wrong, a hundred crore GMV per month, Yeah. Uh, very, very quickly. Uh, yes. But you chose consciously to reduce that uh, yes. GMV as yes. you focused on more profitable cities. Right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I also remember a conversation with, you know, your teams in, in Sutanu and your team, on how you are choosing those cities such that the distribution routes are optimized for cost, right? Yes. So you're choosing cities, for example, Delhi to Chandigarh, but you're also maybe delivering in between because it makes sense to deliver. Yes. Um, I, I, think that, I think that's probably what is the difference between you and some of the other players in the market yeah. with yeah. a very high focus on uh, profitability of operations. Yeah. Yeah, Nikhil, I think this business, there is no, uh, there is no dearth of 
the scale that you can acquire as a company here, right? This is never going to be a 80% share play. This is always going to be a multiplayer market, right? Uh, so I think it's better for us to build a business model that doesn't bleed the company to death as you scale fast. To me, that's the toughest part. The toughest part is like, like you just said, Nikhil, we've done 150 crores in a month, right? And not long back, April of last year, right? But I think yeah. we're just being responsible with the investors' money to say, there's no point in buying sales. Right. Yeah. The other thing, uh, which I, which I, at least I could see as an opportunity in the business is the emergence of a lot of what I would call challenger consumer brands, right? Outside of the HUL and the ITC, there are lots of standalone brands that are now coming, which probably are also looking for better distribution and to get on the shelf space of, of retailers. Are you seeing that as an interesting opportunity or it's outside the, the permit of your focus today? So, you know, exactly from the thinking that we're operating, most of these brands are right now, like I know the Mama Earth founders very well. They're ex-HUL guys yeah. and they go through the mind. Now, if you ask them, uh, they've become their size just on Amazon and Flipkart and maybe a couple of other e com or maybe a few chemist stores, right? right? Their strategy is not to go general trade because it takes a lot of money away. The same problem that I spoke to you about. Yeah. And then there is complete data dark, then there is a lot of damages, shortages, claims, pilferage that comes through. It is easier for these challenge brands to actually build a portfolio online. Right. So, so you could go from kid products to men grooming and, and femme hygiene and so on and so forth and keep using e-commerce as a way to bulk up your company. Hmm. What we are very relevant to is a company like Reckitt Bank. Okay. Now it's a very large company globally. In India also, they're very large, but look at the, if you look at the market construct for a store that sells about a lack of grocery, Reckitt Bank is a three share player. Right. So, in a month, they sell 3,000 rupees of Reckitt products. Now, mm -hmm. Reckitt serves the customer or the retailer four times a, week, a month. So every week, about 800 rupees worth of Reckitt products are sold. So if a distributor has to drop Reckitt to a retailer, which is a median of the store size, which is one lakh a month, the drop size is only 800 rupees, right? right. At our scale, with our efficiencies and technology and and large ticket sizes of 10,000 rupee, 8,000 rupee average order value, our, our cost of drop is 120 rupees. So if you compare that with racket and say for every 800 rupee drop, the distributor is spending 120 rupees and let's say he's cutting corners everywhere. So, you know, pay, don't pay minimum wages and do all the wrong things. And he gets it to even 100 bucks. That's almost 12% as... Uh, you know, cost of logistics, his margin is only 7%, right? right. So for a player, for, even for a player like Reckitt, we are the solution going forward. Understood. Which is why they supply to us directly. Uh, Got it. And, and, and I think that's the, that those are the companies of which we would like to take the distribution directly, right? Uh, it. ITC sells to us directly on credit, 14 days credit, seven days credit. So we would like to be, so it's not just the small guys, even the large guys are super interested in a model like ours. Got it. Okay. Uh, I'll take this question on Taiki, the last question that's come up and then I will move to also your Amazon business because ultimately the lease we're doing is for those assets. Sure. But just to answer Siddharth's question right. uh, is comparing Taiki to a drop shop. Okay. Uh, in terms of, of the proposition, in terms of what they are doing for offering a tech stack for consumer brands and logistics and payments and stuff like that. Would you be able to talk to that? Yeah, but, but see, but the deal is, uh, you, look at, uh, look at the food ordering industry. Mm -hmm. If Swiggy developed a tech stack and mm -hmm. left the fulfillment with the restaurant, would food consumption ordering in would have taken off the way it has? I doubt it. You know, so I think, yeah. It's like Zomato, right? It's Zomato to Swiggy comparison. That is the whole deal. Now, I don't think tech works in India considered as a silo. If you cannot layer your services around a great tech stack and bring what is what I call reliability, okay, nobody is interested in talking to you. And the lower you go in the value chain, uh, the, the lower the reliability becomes, right? Right. So I think it is a very profitable business to build a tech stack, but it can probably do justice to very large stores in very elite pockets. 
right? I wouldn't say there is no place for somebody like that. Of course there is. But it is not a solution which will work for all retail stores uh, ordering all their uh, produce or uh, supplies. That's that's how I would answer that question. Yeah, you know, in just uh, maybe out of context, but in my personal opinion, uh, with some of companies, I think most companies have ended up becoming having to also do the full full part of that stack, right? Yes. Not just the technology, but the operations of it, especially yes. in the India context. I think some of these business models work better abroad, where a lot of other infrastructure exists and you can leverage it. But in, I think in a lot of Indian situations, we have seen ventures having to build some of those uh, build, build some of those operational pies themselves. I agree. Uh, I completely yeah. agree. In actual yeah. NSF, also the business you were talking about, Nikhil, we had just a tech product and we had mm-hmm. services. Now the both the two have come together because even Unilever said, "Listen, the tech works fine, but I need somebody to run the tech for me." Right? Yeah. So we, Absolutely. like I said, we've taken on the services layer of that. Right? Uh, so it's a very important. Uh, I think uh, perspective that I have built over the last 10 years of running Fieldworks, that in India, what you need definitely is very high quality tech in the center. But without the services there, I think we're just waiting to get lucky probably to scale up. Got it. Okay. Um, talking about Amazon, uh, because, and just to give context, the the assets that we're talking about, the warehousing, the racks are the ones that you're using for your Amazon centers, right? Um, and just want to if you could talk a little bit about where that business is in terms of scale and what are you seeing it going happening going forward? Well, Amazon distribution is, uh, they're very serious about this business and we've been working with them for more than a year now and our contract just got renewed or it's in the process. Of, I mean, we have formal confirmations of renewal. Our margin structure has gone up. Uh, we've added more warehouses. We've also added scope. So earlier, part of picking and packing work was happening in Amazon warehouses. So there, what, what's happening is we're using Amazon tech, but like I said, services layer is all ours, right? So warehousing is ours, uh, logistics is our fulfillment is ours, sales is ours, customer management is our problem, but the tech layer or the tech stack is Amazon's, right? So that is limited to in, in Bangalore and Hubli, and that's where AD is. Uh, in rest of the country, the cities that you mentioned. So within Bangalore, also we run our own business. We are on the HSR side, which is uh, which is south, almost south yep. of Bangalore. Uh, Delhi, uh, they don't AD is not there, and Chandigarh AD is not there. So AD also what Amazon distribution, like they call it, is also wanting to scale up and compete with the likes of Reliance. Right? Uh, they want to serve the Indian retailers, and over four years of their iterating on the model, what they've come to a conclusion is that in the front end, they need a player like us, right? They're able to bring inventory from brands and run big warehouses. But when it comes to smaller warehouses, fulfilling a B2B kind of requirement, they're not able to meet that. And when we were getting started with them, we asked them, well, what is the problem? You guys should be able to do it. I mean, you're doing millions of orders a day. What is the big deal in ha- handling another you know, million orders? So the problem is that warehouses are designed to serve B2C customers. Right. So you will see a life boy and a dozen bananas lying next to each other because the data tells them that these two things get ordered together by the customers, right? Now, in that context, to reorganize their entire warehousing structure to start buying in cases and in no particular affinity, right? You know, there is not every life boy seller definitely sells Dalda, okay? Or, or sells fortune, let's say, right? But there is nothing to say that he will buy fortune from Amazon. He could okay. buy fortune from somebody else in the market because he's getting it cheap. So, you know, mm-hmm. your entire DNA goes for a toss the moment you start doing B2B. You know, people think B2B does not have a moat. And I'll tell you why, what. If we did not have a moat, why do we not have 10 multi-billion dollar enterprises here already who are profitable? It right. is not an easy business to build. It's a very hard business to build. It's because much harder. Of, much, much yeah, harder. Margins are way <laughs> foot thin. And you know what? Uh, investors get it, which is why I'm talking about it. I mean, you are talking about 5% in making things work with that, right? Yeah. So it is not an easy game to build. And if you have a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar B2C mindset, to build a multi-billion dollar B2B mindset, it is extremely difficult. So which is where we come in with Amazon. So our understanding with Amazon is that they will work with us as they scale, we scale, and mm-hmm. that there is no non-compete. We can keep doing our business we, and we can collaborate with them. 
Now, at some point in time, can these lifelines converge? I don't know. Maybe they can, maybe they cannot. But I think that is not what we want to discuss right now. We, we, we just want to say we are scaling with them and we're doing a great job with them. Understood. Um, interesting question for Mahadev and Sachin for you is on um, operational leverage, right? Which is applicable both to the Amazon business and to Taiki. Because in a services, services heavy business, um, how do you bring leverage into it? Is it just economies of scale? Is it something, is it, there's a technology layer that gets embedded, which allows you to achieve that scale. Uh, maybe if you could talk to that point. Yeah. Sajin, are you connected with Rajan Pandare by any chance? They, could, they might not be able to answer. Rajan yeah. is the investor through Indian Angel Network in our company, right from 2011. So that's where the question came from. Okay. Right, now, right. our inventory is funded through working capital facilities that we've built. We're not using grip capital to buy uh, working uh, buy inventory at all, right? So, like I mentioned, we've got a five crore. Uh, you grow term sheet, which is supplier financing. Uh, and we're also closed a deal for five crores, which is going live next Tuesday on uh, supplier financing. And we've got a syndicate in Bombay with h is going for 50 lakhs. So we've got about 11 crores. Uh, just yesterday, we got six crores. So, so we, I think we're in a good place right now. We're going to be using that such into for finance our inventory, but I think the most important point, and Sachin, I think this is what we want to watch out as a company. In the next three to six months, we have to move to a negative working capital operating model. So while we have the funds, we will start building our business on that. And as we build the business, our tech has to manage our suppliers in a way, and our payments have to be so timely that we start getting credit from all the suppliers, or at least 80% of our business is on credit of three to six days. The moment we do that, we can actually give up the working capital that we're getting from other sources, which is not grip, and make our business more profitable, right? So it's right now in the next 90 days, we're going to use external borrowed capital to buy and sell and build a relationship with supplier of trust and, and uh, say, you know, mutual trust. Let's keep it simple. Once that's done, we want to move to credit and pure credit. So that, I hope, answers uh, the question that Sachin had asked me. On uh, uh, Mahadevan is asking uh, point of services by also. Sure, I think, uh, well, you know, in our business, uh, Mahadevan, we found warehousing is a, is a step cost. Uh, linear costs for us are actually just one, which is logistics, where we can actually point out to say that 0.1% to 1.1% of sales is logistics cost. Every other cost structure in our business is either, either a step cost or an indirect. Okay. So what I mean by step cost is a uh, sales guy, right? When you add a sales guy, uh, he might start from cost of sales being 1.8%, but then it comes down to 0 0.7, 0 0.6, even goes down to 0.2% in some geographies, right? Where you can do larger transactions with even large retailers, right? I mean, people from Bangalore on this call, if there are any, there is like uh, MKM or who can actually buy 10 lakhs a day, right? That's the nature of that beast in Bangalore. So you could, you, so those are step costs. So uh, I agree with you that supply chain, which is the logistics and the fulfillment aspect in itself is a phenomenally inefficient cost show. And I'll share an example with you. Sudan, who's on the call here, who's my colleague who heads strategy and innovation. Uh, we are actually working, Sudan is working closely with an American supplier of cameras, uh, six node cameras. And we're actually doing a pilot in our, in our fleet, uh, two, two autos only, where we've got three camera nodes looking at the road, one looking at the driver, one inside the cabin, and one at the door outside to track whether the truck is not moving with the GPS tells us because of traffic or because our friend is having a chilled out time, right? So we are taking data and uh, video stream and GPS data to a level to say, who should I get the call center to call and tighten screws on? And who should I not do anything with because he's in a traffic jam? 
So there are a lot, and it's very unreliable right now because decoding a camera feed, Mahadevan, is an exceptionally hard task as you, as you would acknowledge. So we are nascent, but we have enough and plenty ideas to improve operational leverage in, in the direct cost structures of our business. If I can just add uh, from our perspective, because Sachin, we, we uh, lease to a lot of companies in the logistics and warehouse space. And I think as we look at their forward business models on oh, terms of what will actually get them to higher profitability, it comes down to utilization, right? Because as you correctly said, one warehouse or one delivery bike is a step cost, right? But yeah. is your warehouse occupying 60% utilization, 80%? Yeah. Yeah. Is your bike doing 14 deliveries a day, 18 deliveries a day? Absolutely. And I think um, the businesses that you are in by aggregating multiple uh, brands and multiple distributors allows you to achieve higher distribution, right? Higher utilization, sorry. And ultimately that is the operating leverage in your business. Uh, and that allows you to scale and become more profitable. Uh, but it is, you know, it is not as scalable as pure software. I think we all know that, yeah. but uh, that is the, that is the leverage in the business. Yeah, Nikhil, look at it. I mean, because we did not have a partner like you, and I'm really hoping we will get you today. Uh, our, our we're, we're already halfway there. Yeah, our, our <laughs> is our uh, single story, right? We don't have a mezzanine. Okay. Now, but think about it, Nikhil. It's like how many ground floor bungalows do you see in Delhi today? Right? Yeah. There is a reason why high rise came through. We have not built that because we did not have the capability to invest in capex. With you, we are hoping that that will come in. So while I can store heavy and bulky, like we call it, like, you know, oil, ghee, uh, washing powder, detergent, floor cleaner, all those things which sell in a liter or more or 30 kgs atta bag from the ground floor, building a mezzanine floor in our warehouses uh, helps you stock luxury pens, uniball, uh, feminine care, like sanitary pads, which are very lightweight, right? And you can stack those up. So when we pay 20 bucks a square feet and we use only ground floor, you are able to stack up to six high. But when you build a mezzanine, you're able to stack 12 high. And for us, yeah. right now we are at 8,000 rupees a square foot if we were fully utilizing it. With grip investing, we could become 16,000 bucks a square foot when yeah. I paid 20 bucks. So 16,000 rupees of sale per square foot or a 20 square foot. And if you make take rates of 3% is a highly profitable business. Uh, so those are those are some of the things. So we have to look at all our cost rows and beat them down, which is why I responded. That's the biggest difference between Uran and us. We are already saying we are small. You either get this right right now or you are never going to get this right. Fair enough. No, that's great to hear. Uh, yeah. Very encouraging. Um, why don't we wrap up the con the context in the business with the last question from Mayank, which is on the Amazon contract. Yeah. Do you do you have a lock in period with Amazon? Okay, so let's 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 actually answer this in a very different way because uh, because you know what happens is because of the brand name and the size, it is sometimes difficult to. So Amazon is dependent on us; we are not dependent on Amazon, okay? <laughs> right? Because this market is so large. I mean, Delhi, I get no support from them. I'm large. I, I was larger in Delhi than I was in Bangalore. Okay. We break even on Amazon contract. We've disclosed that in full governance in your note. It's not like we make money on Amazon. Right. Mm -hmm. I've said we, we have broken even on Amazon. Yeah. So A, they're not going to go away. Okay. Because they need us. They've had four years. They've failed year after year in building out their front end. They've got us with great difficulty. We've been extremely clear with them about our terms. Uh, if I don't see why Amazon will not be with us for about a year or more, uh, the only reason could be that we don't find them worth our while anymore. I, I, I don't lose sleep over uh, Amazon. I, I lose sleep over uh, profitability. Fair enough. Okay. Um, perfect. Uh, you know, if you can give me a couple of minutes, I'll talk about the transaction. And we'll, we'll wrap up this call, Sachin. Um, and also, I'll answer Anuj's question um, in, the, in the process. Um, just to remind everyone, we are, we are doing a transaction which is leasing storage uh, or storage racks to Peelworks. This is for their deployment with Amazon. At the same time, this is combined with, it, with leasing of, of coffee machines to Glow Tokai. As part of the transaction with Peelworks, um, because they have a very steady stream of revenue from HUL, there is also an escrow of those payments which cover the Peelworks rental on a month-on-month -month basis. That's an additional security feature that 
that uh, Peelworks and Grip have agreed to, and that will be part of the transaction. Uh, this is a three-year lease term, and one of the new things that we have done, Sachin, you also may not be aware of this. For the first time, we have offered a liquidity option to our investors. Uh, three years can be a long period of time in some in some perspective, and Grip's own conviction in this deal allows us to offer 20% of investors, first 20% of investors, to choose to exit the deal anytime after 12 months. And yeah. we're contributing 20% of our own capital to purchase any investor who chooses to seek that liquidity. Uh, this is the first time we have piloted with this option on the platform. Uh, we're looking to definitely do it for all of our deals. Uh, it's a question of our own capital and how we, how we finance that option. Uh, but this is definitely the right deal where we thought we could start it off with. Um, as I mentioned, this deal is already 50% complete and we hope to wrap it off and begin this relationship with Peelworks uh, in the next week. Uh, Anuj, to your question, um, I think uh, Sachin talked about it earlier. They are already talking to NBFCs. They don't currently provide credit from their business, but they are talking to NBFCs to provide credit to the smaller businesses. And uh, I think this is, you know, FinTech is going through such an interesting phase where different pieces of the capital table are being broken. Everyone used to only think about equity and debt, but suddenly you're talking about inventory financing, lease financing, bill discounting, yeah. you know, uh, revenue-based financing. I think it's such an interesting time to be building a fintech business, but also being building a, being a founder and building anything uh, and building a fintech layer on top of it. Um, yeah, so, I agree. Yeah. Supply chain, warehousing, uh, NBFCs, credit, uh, supplier financing, working capital management, revenue financing. Uh, I think this the time for all this has come simply because you have some data to say who's a thief and who's not, right? Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that I want to highlight, which we are very proud about is uh, our cap table comprises listed entities such as Unilever Ventures, HDFC Bank, uh, RPC and Jeep Goenka Group via CSC Ventures. And we've had multiple rounds from each of our investors over the last few years. There are a lot of Indian Angel Network investors who've been on the cap table since 2011. Uh, I mean, you know, feel free to do any ref check with any of our investors and, and they, will, they, they will support what they've experienced of the company in the last 11 years. Uh, so yeah. we have a different mindset. We want to take this company large, public. Uh, we, are, we are a level-headed bunch of gray-haired people uh, from great backgrounds and good business schools, uh, a diversity-friendly company. So, uh, so that's what who we are, and it'll be really great to start a journey. I, I would actually urge Nikhil and Vivek to push for a crore because okay. there is so much working capital that's coming in. We will need more racks and and more capex to come in. So, I would say please open the doors and and welcome all your investors uh, from our side as a token of goodwill. If that does not bother your compliance side, I'm happy to put a five lakh check into this round of my own money uh, as a token of confidence. And I don't want early exit. Okay, so don't come <laughs> in as a 20% guy. I'm happy to sure. be the last guy out, but I'm happy to put the five lakhs in uh, from my wife's uh, savings uh, to, to just show the investor this is the right thing to do. Oh, wow. That, I mean, I don't think there can be a bigger sign of confidence. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. No, that's, that, I think that's something that would, uh, you know, give confidence to a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, we are yeah. as excited and, and Sachin, you know, you know that I have spoke, we have spoken to maybe four of your institutional investors, right. Diplo's on the call, uh, but spoken to several others. And I think in each of those conversations, what stood out is the belief in you, your founders, your co-founders and the business um, and just excitement about what you're building and your ability to to prove the business model and deliver. So very excited to start this relationship. Uh, I think it's it's a, it's a definitely see this as a very long-term scalable partnership. Well, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So let me know how I can send the check across or via the funds, but it's sure. a commitment. You've recorded it. Let your investors yeah. know I'm, I'm going to be a part of this round. We'll definitely be in touch. And, okay. you know, I have to say this has been one of our most engaging webinars. I think the quality of questions was was very high level. Thank you so much for being uh, so clear and about the business and, and sharing so much with us. Really, really appreciate it and look forward to working together. Well, pleasure is mine. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of our audience who joined today. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Sachin. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nikhil. Bye. Bye. Yes.